All right, everyone. Hi, we are live, um, and welcome to the second block of the Phys Ed Summit 4.0. We're so glad that you could join us today for this presentation. Um, my name is Colin Brooks, and I'm a member of the Phys Ed Summit team. And as I was saying, we're so happy that you could join us uh, for this physical education uh, professional development opportunity. Um, with that being said, uh, we are viewing all presentations on the TOSL. So uh, make sure that you ask any questions for our presenters within that TOSL, and we should be good to go as far as that goes. Um, just type it into the back channel and ask them any questions that you have. In case of any technical difficulties, if the video feed does not work, is not working, um, I will set up a new link within the TOSL. All right, with that being said, um, we have two people here, and it looks like Steve has hopped out for a second. So Heidi, I'm gonna just pass it over to you. I'm gonna have you introduce the topic in which you're speaking about and a little bit about yourself. Go ahead, Heidi. All right, uh, thank you everyone for showing up to this presentation. Uh, welcome to the Physagogy, Physagogy Summit 4.0. My presentation is on game modification for learning tactical concepts and net wall games. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm an associate professor at Westfield State University, and I completed my doctorate at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And some of my research interests and just general interests are in game knowledge, student game knowledge, as well as pre-service teacher game knowledge. And I'm super interested in pedagogical models like sport education and teaching games for understanding, which I'll be talking about today. Um, Pre-service teacher development, as well as communities of practice. Um, I'm on the executive board for the Teaching Games for Understanding SIG. I'm treasurer, and I also serve as a new professional liaison at the state Massachusetts APERD. All right, just to give you um, an advanced organizer for what I'll be sharing with you today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the net wall games category, and I'm going to spend a lot of a little bit of time sharing with you how to get a good game going and we'll talk about modification to support learners development and how teachers can be games designers and then i'm going to spend a lot of time at developmental progressions and different complexity levels so we'll talk about inexperienced novices as well as um, experienced novice um, so we can ask the question, how are games classified? And when you think about that, I typically think about um, how one scores in a game. So in net wall games, one scores by placing the object into the opposing team's court or space so that it can't be returned. So when you think about the object of net wall games, uh, we can relate it back to the different net wall games, such as volleyball, tennis, um, four square, and elementary or nitro ball. So these are um, some of the games. We'll be talking about the concepts um, shared across these games. All right, to get started, I want to talk about getting a good game going. So what do you think of when you think of childhood games? I think of the movie Sandlot or children playing basketball in a driveway. Um, and volleyball at family picnics. In, ch in childhood games, children play with the people in the neighborhood or siblings and family. They play with the people who are available. Uh, you make do with who you have and what equipment you have and the space available. So for example, if you were playing a volleyball game, you might be playing in the driveway with a chalk line or a, a rope between two trash cans. And you make up the rules as you go along um, there's not too many rules, but the rules kind of keep the game close, so um, it's sort of even, and it's enjoyable for all the people involved. These, these games are child-designed, and they're child-owned. They're modeled after aspects of the real game, but they're modified and they're exaggerated to meet the needs of the people involved. That's exactly what we need to do in physical education and even in a sporting environment. Uh, the challenge comes when teachers and even coaches feel like that they have to teach the rules and the skills in detail of the sport and play the full game 
in a single unit. Uh, and teaching games for understanding, the goal is to draw students into the game, to get them excited by not making the game too complex for them. Once students start seeing themselves as good games players, um, they're more willing to learn about particular skills and decisions of the game. So just like childhood games, all kids have to do is just show up. So we have kids in physical education that just show up. When we throw out all the game rules and put them in large-sided games, it puts many of them on the spot uh, with very few opportunities or attempts to practice or understand the game. And then that's when they say, I can't play volleyball or I can't play badminton. So in TGFE, we provide a slice of the game that shows a problem that would need to be solved in that larger game. So we think about how we can change rules for other parts of the game to highlight aspects of the game in a simplified way so that students can be successful. We teach the skill and the tactical decision together. In TGFU, we actually use the game as the teacher. So how can we modify games then? Um, here, here are a myriad of ways. Um, and all of these ways listed here, I'm sure that you're very familiar with. We do them all the time in the physical education environment. Um, but one thing that we need to consider is how can we use these game changes to really facilitate learning and tactical understanding in those games? Um, rather than just supporting students' needs, how do we help them think by constraining the environment? So we can change the equipment, the space, the people, the rules, um, while keeping the same intention of the original game. So for example, um, if we look at changing the space, um, we can make courts long and narrow or short and wide. Um, when courts are long and narrow, um, it sort of highlights the length of the court, so students are likely to look um, at the spaces behind their opponent as well as the spaces in front of their opponent, opponent um, to create space and look for that open spot to score. Another example would be um, rules for scoring. Uh, so you see there points for containing the ball. If we are in a, uh, a volleyball-like situation, um, typically start, start to serve with a free ball toss um, to that right back person. And we would award points if that individual can um, contain that ball in their own space or even use a forearm pass to keep the ball up within their court area, you would award a point uh, for that. And then the play would continue. Um, as the ball keeps going over the net, you would, you know, each team would continue with award of points for containing it on their side as well as scoring on the opposite side. So uh, let's move down to complexity. I'm going to talk a lot about complexity today. Um, I have here inexperienced novice learners and experienced novice learners. Um, this is the way that I like to talk about it. Um, some of the authors, uh, Mitchell Griffin and Oslin, is a primary resource I'm using today. Um, they're, they're going to explain in, what I call inexperienced novice learners as second through fifth grade. And then experienced novice learners would be secondary. Um, but I like to use um, the terms I have there is because I believe that a person of any age could be at any of these levels, and I think that's really important for us to think about. So there are going to be uh, three levels in netwall games for both of these um, um, inexperienced and experienced novice learners. If you look at other category, um, there may be um, a greater number of levels in the experienced novice learners. So um, at the level one, we're really looking at singles throw catch or um, singles where you toss the ball to the wall and catch. We're looking at keeping a rally going, so this may be more cooperative. How many times uh, can you and your partner catch the ball in a row? Uh, we also may be starting to look at how do we uh, begin to set up an attack or make our opponent move, and then looking at court spaces. So some of these fundamental aspects are going to be learning about the boundaries of the game and how they impact small-sided games as well as some etiquette and how to uh, start and restart play. 
these games are going to progress from cooperative and then to competitive. And most of the time, you're going to find yourself using the court lines as your nets. You can use uh, lower nets. And sometimes, uh, depending on what equipment you have available, you may want to use cones and jump ropes for your space. So why do you think we are throwing and catching instead of giving students rackets? I'll let you think about that for a minute as I move forward into this presentation. Um, Tactical problems that we're going to look at here are maintaining a rally using an underhand throw, move to catch, read and anticipate. We're looking at the long and short aspects of the court and then returning to base. So uh, this video I'm about to show you is a game of throw tennis. You can see they're using low nets and court space. Sorry there. Court space is long and narrow. And these students are working on keeping a rally. So they throw catch. They're throwing from where they catch it. They're throwing it to the other player. Um, so we're working on some throwing and catching skills as well as tracking the ball, um, keeping the ball within the boundaries. Uh, but we're, we're doing that in a, a game-like situation. All right. Let's see if we can, there we go. Um, so some other games that you also could play at this level would be a 1v1 cooperative wall bounce target game. Um, so this would be throwing the ball against the wall um, uh, with two people. You can vary the toss line level, so if you make it low or high, that's going to change the experience for the student and how they solve that problem. Um, the idea here is to explore getting the object to specific spaces on the court after it comes off the wall. Um, so other things that you could do to help challenge them or help them think about this is to put um, some tape or spots or hula hoops on the floor so that when they toss it, they can attempt to hit those target areas. And then their, their partner would catch it. So this is a, um, a more planned type game, so students would, you know, know what space in the court they're aiming for uh, so that it is expected. Um, it takes out the complexity. Uh, then you have 1v1 semi-cooperative throw tennis or wall ball. So the idea here is to still play cooperatively and track your number of catches, um, but the idea is to make the other person move. So here we're really combining some more decision making with that skill. And then um, you can take it into a, a more complex competitive throw tennis or um, wall ball where you're keeping the other person from returning it and keeping track of your points. In all these games you can also add more players uh, to increase the complexity and if you do that you may also want to think about changing the space um, so students can move. In these games you want to use an underhand toss uh, so that helps us really highlight the tactical problem of moving to catch. Um, when students start throwing overhand, they really start exploring the idea of force. We're not quite there yet, but the underhand toss also keeps the game safe. So always toss from where you catch. You can change that space to um, enhance tactical focus. And then the type of object that you use, depending on your student's ability, um, you, want, you want them to be able to track that object. So you might use a softy tennis ball to slow that bounce down or use a, a bigger ball um, if students struggle to manipulate the ball off the bounce. But you can also vary that to enhance the challenge. Um, so one other thing that I wanted to uh, discuss as we move into level two, you notice that we're moving into striking uh, with the underhand. So um, this is going to speed up the game. So why we don't put um, an implement in a, in a student's hand at level one or in level two um, is basically because they don't have that skill completely down yet. We want them to be involved in the game and to be able to make decisions in the game um, without that complex aspect. So we're sort of building their decision-making skills and their ability to see things on the court before we put that implement in their hand. At level two, we're just speeding up the pace of the game um, using that underhand strike. 
Then we can move to two contact games using a throw catch. So um, we're going back when we add another person into the game. So this would be a volleyball-like situation. Here we're focusing on establishing um, the environment a little more. What are the boundaries? What are the rules? And how do the, the rules sort of impact uh, the game? Maintaining a rally. And we're going to add winning points now. Um, at this level, we can also repeat um, some of the concepts or even the games at level one, but just include that underhand strike um, to move the ball over a line or a net. So this is very effective for moving to our next progression at level three of using modified rackets. Heidi? Yes? Hey, is it all right if I ask you a question from the tozzle? Absolutely. Awesome. So um, Steve Johnson, the fellow uh, Oregonian, is wondering, um, you know, he's, he struggles with the length of units and how long uh, those units should be. He's wondering, what are your recommendations as far as, far as how long uh, a unit should be? And he sees his students um, for 35 minutes, and he sees them, let's see, uh, one to, tr I think he sees them uh, every other day. Okay. Um, that's very typical of uh, what I see in the elementary schools. Um, Hi, Steve. Thanks for your question. Um, in just a minute, I'm also going to be talking about uh, game sampling, so I could talk about that right now, I suppose. Um, but that would be one recommendation. So um, we don't want to think uh, of a unit as being strictly for volleyball or strictly for pickleball or maybe even throw tennis if we were breaking it down further. Um, but what we could do if we are limited on time and how, how many units that we could get in, we could make our um, unit a net wall unit um, where you would pick out maybe one or two tactical problems that you're working on with students and you could carry those across um, you know if you're at a level three which I haven't talked about yet um, you may be playing more game specific and related to specific tactical problems that way or um, you, you know you may be doing uh, throw catch type games or catching over the net um, and moving to open space maintaining a rally. You would just focus on a couple of problems and then change the equipment, change the space, um, and, and perhaps even the number of people um, playing. Um, so that, that would be um, one example I can give you. Um, and Steve, if you want to chime in, if you have other ideas as well, um, feel free. So, Heidi, can I, uh, just a quick follow-up to that. Um, should we, as practitioners, be more focused on less units? Because I know there's a lot of physical education teachers out there and if, that are thinking this, and if they're doing TGFU, should the focus be more on um, just the length? Of the, should the units be longer, or should we focus like, hey, we've got to hit you know, so many different sports or physical activities uh, to help our students to be physically literate? So what are your thoughts on that? All right, that's a great question. Um, in my personal opinion, I think units should be longer. Uh, we're trying to create some meaning making, and I think if students gain some understanding because they've engaged longer in a unit, they've learned more within a unit, I think that information is going to be transferable. In um, particular, you know, if you start out, um, let's just say that you, you're, you want to focus in on concepts of volleyball all those concepts are going to transfer um, to you know tennis type games, pickleball type games, badminton type games. So that is a true benefit um, of this model because we can expect that those things would transfer and we can um, make links in our lessons to other games as well and talk about that transfer. But students need time to learn and I, I believe uh, lengthening our units and engaging more, particularly if we can focus in on particular things and we're not doing uh, the same things or the exact same way with this, the same equipment every day, then they're, they're less likely to get bored. Great. Yeah, yeah they, um, there was a couple of research studies done, uh, one recent one with a, a systematic review of the literature suggested Longer units were better. Um, Hasty did a study comparing sport education with a more traditional unit, and both groups learnt 
you know, over the course of the unit, but the sport education group learnt more. And we know that modified games are a big part of sport education. So I would indicate that, uh, or that would indicate that uh, even if you do longer units with a more traditional approach, you're going to get more benefit. So I would argue that what we want to be focusing on is, as Heidi's saying, longer units um, at the depth of learning rather than just trying to sort of cover the curriculum, so to speak. All right. Go ahead, Heidi. Thanks. So let's um, let's look at the tactical problems quickly for level two. We're looking at maintaining a rally again, uh, but we're using the underhand strike, and we want to focus on just the forehand only. Um, when we set up for attack, we're looking for those more deep shots. We can focus in on the lob, the drive, and clear, opening up to teammates um, when there's more people involved. And then we're going to add winning the point where we attack those open spaces. We start thinking about those uh, to score. And then covering a court as a team. Uh, so we start getting, you're thinking about how you defend the space with you know, more, more players on it and sliding. So I've got a couple of examples to show you here. This is a game of deck tennis. So students are, this is like a modified volleyball game, but students are using a deck ring and a wide court. And they're really, um, here they're working on their passes and trying to get that hoop up close to the net so they can score more easily. They're also working on, I believe these students are working on um, moving closer to the net to catch and trading places so that they're not standing in one spot. So those are some rules um, that are probably being implemented here. All right, uh, these two games, these are what we call catch ball and um, also known as nukem. This is an elementary class. Um, the net is fairly high, and they're throwing and catching the ball over the net. The court can be divided into positions. So students, um, so in this game, students um, are in quadrants of the court, so responsible for covering a particular area, and they can make up to three passes and catch it and then put it to the other side over the net. This is the same game. This is with my college students just to demonstrate that this can be a great game for older students as well. Um, and our older students need just as much work uh, and, and help at making decisions in games. This one would be this one is another modification of that same game. Uh, the students are bouncing um, the ball to make catches on their side of the net and then trying to score on the other side of the net by bouncing it out of bounds. You notice uh, net is high, but they're tossing it under. Um, Going under the net is also a great way to teach these movement concepts of defending space. And here with the bounce, they're working on looking at angles. You know, how do you bounce that ball at an angle so your opponent can't return it? And then we have the level three. Um, typically, this, this may be at fourth or fifth grade. Um, you're looking at one bounce games or no bounce games. Um, we're adding the paddles here. Um, so they have learned how to look at court space, they've experienced how to move, how to maintain a rally, how to look at open space, so now we're going to add the complexity of an implement in their hand. Um, whenever we do this, we really want to consider using slower flight objects so that students can track the ball and move to get that racket in position. So things like those softy tennis balls, um, I have a colleague at an elementary school who uses a larger um, birdies, they're slower flight. They seem to really work well. Um, we can also move into two contact games and we're going to start striking with a hand in volleyball-like games. 
We're looking at offensive concepts uh, such as maintaining a rally and setting up to attack. You're really looking at those deep, short, and approach shots in, in games like tennis and pickleball. And then we're looking at that uh, component of passing and setting in volleyball. So you know, we've looked at how do you keep it on your side. Now how do you uh, get it to the front of the net by passing and setting. And winning the point using you know, the volley, the smash, and spike. Um, really here we're not focusing a lot on accuracy. We're just looking at that attempt and exploring power and velocity uh, within that game. And then we're looking at space decisions as well as movement for backing up teammates and shifting to cover. This is a very um, difficult concept uh, for individuals to learn, um, especially the novice, because a lot of them, you know, they like to stand and watch the ball as it comes over. So um, here we're really learning how do you move when the ball's in the air, and we can set up uh, particular rules or situations that would cause them to move. Um, you're going to see uh, at the end of this presentation, which is actually a um, experienced novice uh, game. Um, but we can set up spots in the back of the net and they get points for uh, returning to the spot after they um, make a hit. Defending against an attack and decisions um, and movements that go along with that. Um, so blocking downward hits. So when do you when do you move towards the net and how do you uh, how do you know when someone is going to use a downward hit? So these um, these skills and movements are uh, more sports specific. And they're going to require some additional time and practice in that task. So once again, those longer units are going to be uh, more and more important so you can focus in on those things. Um, additionally, you can cover um, one lesson that's spread out over several classes to help them with that concept. Um, this is another uh, modification on the games that you've seen. Um, this game, the serve is coming over as a, a toss, and it's allowed to hit the floor uh, before the receiver gets it. And then it's a toss to the setter. The setter sets using um, a setting motion, and then we're attempting to hit with the spike. So we really slow down the complexity and slow down the game uh, using that toss, and we really accentuate the set and the hit. Um, so that students can move and think about how to get the ball forward. Right, this um, is a novice continuum for decision making regarding object placement and net wall. And this is some research that I did uh, in my dissertation with fifth grade students. And what I found is that students um, they can start anywhere on this continuum, but they move through this continuum throughout a unit depending on the complexity. But we have uh, reactive over to the left, and this is when students just attempt to make contact with no decision of placement. So they're really focused on skill and just getting that ball over. And then we have cooperative cognitive, and this is hitting it to your opponent cooperatively. So they're they're, they're uh, really focused in and thinking about how do we get it to, to that other person on the other side so that it can be returned so that we have a good game going. And then they'll move to competitive effort. And this is where they're really trying to start winning points, but they're still hitting it to their opponent. So they're really using that, the force to try to score and hitting that ball hard. And in, in, this, um, in this part of the continuum, you're going to see balls flying out the end zone quite a bit. So they're not going to be able to score very um, effectively um, because that force is you know, going out, causing the ball to go out of bounds. And, and that's OK, because they're just exploring and, and trying that out. And eventually, they'll move to this competitive cognitive where they'll really see that you know, this isn't working for scoring. So how can I move my opponent and then look at that open space to score? So they really start thinking about that. And this is um, what I talked about with Steve's question a minute ago, game sampling. So this is where we uh, look at a variety of tactical problems across a unit and explore those so that we're hopefully getting some transfer of game knowledge and common tactics, um, such as you know, how do we use open space to win a point? Um, 
what is our court awareness and how do we create space and attack and where do I need to be uh, in order to return the ball again and then you know what what is the court positioning of my teammates and my opposition now we can move into the developmental progressions of uh, experienced novice learners and we're going to progressively be playing more complex forms of really clearly outlined tactical problems to be solved in these games. Um, these are going to be a lot more sports specific and we really need to, um, whenever we have our uh, question and answer segments um, in a TGFU lesson, I believe Steve's going to be talking about that in the next uh, session, but we can talk about you know how how this transfers to other games and help them make those connections. Um, in, in in these games and in this kind of lesson situation, we may want to um, stop a particular game and bring them into a uh, situated type practice. So we may be working on a decision and a skill at the same time, and we slow it down and give them multiple opportunities to practice. Uh, so it's game-like. Uh, sometimes these are a little bit more drill-like, but they are um, they're slowed down and they continue to be very game-like just to refine those skills. I'm going to talk um, briefly about adaptation games and action fantasy games that we can use at this level as well. So for level one at this experienced novice level, we're going to use the simplest game form. Um, to me, this is kind of a review of the elementary level three, uh, but these students are going to be older, um, so we can get into a that deeper cognitive component here. Uh, we're going to be looking at ball placement, court positioning, restarting play. We want to continue to use that cooperative free toss to a specified receiver, um, and this is this is because when we start with a serve with uh, novice students. One, it's very difficult for them to serve, and two, it's very difficult uh, to receive a hard, you know, downward angle serve, and it's hard to get a good game going. So even in my college activity classes, students are using a uh, cooperative free toss, and they don't complain. They, they love it, and they're having a good time uh, learning about the game. So we're really laying that groundwork for setting up the tack and containing that ball uh, so we can hone in on really winning that point. So, hey Heidi. Uh, yes. A quick question as I'm listening. Um, this a great modifications. What other modifications can you offer in this kind of situation? Is that the main one that you recommend or you know, how often do you recommend changing surface areas of a, of, of a ball or an object or anything such as that? Well I think um, you can change it up really at any point. You have to be a keen observer as the teacher and depending on how the students are responding and reacting, um, you can you can change it up um, in order to initiate that response that you want. So yeah, you may you may end up um, you know using a softy ball for that cooperative free toss and that forearm pass until they're ready to use maybe even a harder ball. Um, you can even break it down uh, and use bean bags um, if they're not really understanding, um, for instance, that cooperative free toss. The toss has to be a really good and effective toss um, for that forearm pass to work. So you can, you know, begin to set up with a beanbag how to get that rainbow toss in so that we can get effective play going. But, yeah, um, changing the net size, changing the length of the width of the court, um, I suppose you could use different surfaces. I haven't really seen a lot of this in uh, these type games, but I'm I'm sure there is a purpose. I can't really think of one right now um, when you said surface. Um, so yeah, did you have anything in mind that you were thinking about? Great, um, yeah. Uh, not really. I just wanted to know as I was listening, you know, just all the different modifications that you know you'd recommend for for those who are listening. So those are great. So thank you. So. Um, so these, we're really looking at some on the ball skills here. So when you have the ball, um, how you how do you react and uh, what skills do you use? So we're looking um, at how to return and rally that object effectively, and where do we place it? 
And then we're looking at off the ball movements, which would be um, could be whenever your team has the ball in possession, but it's not you that has the ball or that isn't receiving the ball. Um, so what do you do and how do you support your teammate? And as well as when you're in the opposition, how do you react um, to what the offense is doing? So returning to base, opening up in volleyball, and really reading and anticipating through movement um, and transitioning among spaces on the court, um, depending on who has the ball. So I have a couple more examples. So you can, um, this is sort of interesting. Uh, this is my uh, college activity class. So how can we help here? So um, I just wanted to show you this because even older students, my students have a lot of difficulty learning to contain that ball. And um, even in this video, you see that it is a, a free ball uh, pass right to him. Um, so, you know, just giving a lot of feedback, you know, maybe we need to change the angle of the toss there and, and talk with that, the server there, or have the person scoot up. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can change here um, to facilitate um, students' ability to use that form pass, but it, it, it's just a lot of practice. When we do it like this, students have the opportunity to practice containing that ball over and over and over, and they, they may need some feedback from us as well on body positioning. Um, this video uh, is similar. You're going to see um, they're going to be hitting it back and forth, so they're not really setting up to attack. I call this whack-a-ball. So even older students just focus on getting it over the net. And there was the setup, and they scored. Um, so we can see when they do set up, you know, they can they can be rewarded by the game itself because they can win the point. Um, but how else can we help here? Um, one thing that you can implement is a change of the rules. So you could also score by um, you know, executing two or three passes, or you can't score unless you set up to attack. Uh, and that sort of eliminates some of the what I call whack-a-mole uh, play. Our level two um, experienced novice learners. So we're going to really start, did I already do this slide? Deepen students' understanding. Um, so we can review those same levels um, it are the same problems in level one, and, but we're going to continue um, to focus on, you know, hitting that down ball and smash. So we're going to really focus on how we can accomplish those skills more effectively and then transitioning to new positions. Um, a lot of times um, students are going to be pursuing and saving the ball because um, they're not able to contain it effectively. They may be able to contain it on their side, but it may be heading out of bounds. So how do we pursue and save it so that we can keep the rally going? We're going to continue here with uh, cooperative restarts. And here we can start adding more expected variability with that toss. So we may uh, say that you can, you, when you um, serve the ball and you toss it over, you can um, send it to the left or the right of the receiver, and uh, maybe even to the back uh, left. So you can change that up. We just want to keep it expected because it takes out the complexity of the game so they're successful. All right, at level three, um, we introduce the serve here. So think about why, why have we not introduced the serve until now? And I've talked a little bit about that. But here we're going to use an underhand serve, uh, which is going to be, uh, when it goes over the net, it's probably going to be a lot a higher arc, kind of softer coming in. And if, if we're using overhand um, or an overhead serve, we don't want to have an ace. So we want to be able to keep the good game going so you can't score on an ace. We want to allow the ball to hit the net. So we, we would put that rule in that it can touch the net if it goes over. And then... Um, Sometimes on a serve, that ball is going to kind of go probably where it shouldn't out of bounds. So we can expand that service area uh, where the ball can land on a serve just to enhance, um, enhance the game and keep it going uh, so that it's not always stopping. 
Um, we can move to progressions of moving servers placement of the ball slowly. So if we keep it sort of open that they don't have to direct it anywhere, it, it really helps the server just get it over. Um, and then we can move to a cooperative, uh, more directed to one person. So we really start practicing, honing in on that accuracy skill. And then we can start moving to a more competitive where we're trying to hit it to an open area away from the opponent and maybe implement an ace on the serve. Um, and we can add changing the server's location on the end line. Um, I realize I'm talking a lot about volleyball here, but you can do this in almost any game. Um, volleyball is just the, the, the game that tends to come to my mind. Um, I know a little more about it, and I tend to um, have more volleyball units that I teach. Um, here, because now we are serving the ball, it's, it's coming in at a harder angle, it's coming in a little faster. Now we need to start working on those serve-receive you know, how do you, how do you um, return or uh, keep a harder ball up in the air and keep it on your side? And what kind of formations do we need to support each other? Um, so you start talking about the dig, and you have more complex game-like practices intermittent with uh, the mini-games. Um, so you have those skill combinations and movements in 3v3 and 4v4. Um, so larger teams become more necessary to meet the needs of students as they grow to understand the game. Um, you want to keep it more exciting for them and start uh, making the problems a little more complex to keep them interested. Hey, Heidi. Yes, Colin. Uh, I've got a question from um, Rob in the Tozzle. And it's, uh, All right. Hi, Rob. Related, it's related to uh, size of, uh, of the ball. So he asked, any experience with using a different size or type of ball that is more forgiving? like uh, different tennis balls or anything such as that? Absolutely. I would say any of those. I've, um, gosh, in any of these games, I've used um, the little uh, rag balls if you're doing throw catch. Um, the softy volleyballs for volleyball work really great with my college students. Um, even my college students um, don't like the harder volleyballs, but then they grow to kind of want them. Um, you know, uh, you can you can do playground balls. I've seen uh, with wall ball the little the little balls that have the knobs on them. You can use those to uh, really amp the complexity of that game. Um, so yeah, I I think uh, just trying any types of balls or um, objects, um, and you can just play around with them because because. Um, you know, not every group of students is going to react the same way, um, you know, to, to even these games that I have listed here or a particular kind of uh, modification or manipulation. So you have to you kind of play around with it and, and adapt to uh, how you think the students will react and meet their needs. So absolutely. Great. Hey, thanks, thanks for getting back to that question. Just want to let you know we have about five more minutes. All right. I think we're getting close. Um, so yeah, and also in this level three, um, you can re revisit other level lessons, just adding that competitive survey. So we're really working on um, what, what, what I've heard as the four R's. So you're learning to read that ball. Uh, how do you react, um, you know, once you see where it's going and then responding appropriately and then returning or getting back to base so that you can um, start that rally over. Uh, I've got a couple of videos to show you. This is what I was talking about earlier. This is badminton uh, with some Bridgewater State University college students. And they're playing what's called hit and touch baseline. Uh, so we've got uh, teams of two and they're rallying. After they hit the birdie, they have to go back and touch that dot. Um, the dot is set in the center of the court. So we're really highlighting um, for the the opposition, that open space at the front of the net and behind the net. The students are also starting to explore, you know, some footwork. How do they work in and around um, their teammate and kind of stay out of each other's way? Um, so that's another way, um, as a games designer or games facilitator, um, you can create, um, help create uh, space for students to really highlight that off space. And this is the same game, but we move the spot over to the left, and it really uh, 
highlights that opposite side and you're hoping that the idea is that you want students to recognize that that's the space open on the court. Um, do they always get it? No. Uh, but eventually they do, particularly if you're um, engaging in questions and answers with them. All right, and then we have action fantasy games. Um, in my understanding, I haven't done a lot of action fantasy games. This is uh, Steven's niche that he just uh, showed me and I've learned from him. But I believe this is whenever you, you kind of create a situation or a scenario uh, for students playing on teams. Um, for example, there you see on the, the right, um, it's a match status. Aces are up one, game to none. Um, the offense 20, aces 16, aces have the serve. The offense have one timeout left, and aces have two. So it's kind of like, what do you do? So you can play out situations. And Steve, if you want to add anything here. Yeah, sure. Um, I think... You know, a couple of people's points about how do you keep a, a unit going and uh, keep it stimulating for the students. So, throwing these in uh, every, you know, every f few lessons or a couple of lessons just give them the uh, the way of ap applying some of that knowledge in a, you know, a, a, where there's some decision making. You can give them the card. They can go in their teams or individually or in pairs and do a think pair share or whatever and think about what their strategy is going to be. They can then play the game from the different perspectives. So the one on the right is, um, you know, it's a volleyball game. So with their team, they can get together, um, think about a plan, go out and uh, execute that plan, and then come back and reflect on it, and then have another opportunity to go through that plan again. And then obviously you can switch roles. So if you were the up team, you're now the down team. Um, you know, so if you were aces in in one game, you'd then be the dolphins in the next. So this is just a good way of adding uh, what it's what Alan Launder calls enhancing play. I think a lot of the time we maybe focus on um, the games and uh, like Heidi just showed, there was a lot of movement in one of those games. But sometimes if the students um, have got the concepts down, they need a little bit more of a challenge. The action fantasy games allows that to occur. Um, on the left, we have um, a, this was something from a, an article that we had, but. Um, we have a Davis Cup final, and it's the USA versus Great Britain. Go Great Britain! I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's um, the basic. It's a pickleball game, and basic pickleball rules and the games, uh, and then you give them a situation. Now, what we did with this is we created a number of different cards. So we gave out the cards to. We made like sport ed teams, and then gave out different cards to different teams. And then they, we told them even the match situation. So, like, the match is three rubbers to one. And then one team was USA, one team was Great Britain. So, actually, the big group of people have to come together. Um, and th this, again, is a good way. I mean, even at fifth grade, fourth grade, getting kids excited about playing the game. And it sort of brings together a little bit of that those sport ed con uh, concepts, but you don't really need, like, persistent teams and that kind of thing. Um and then what we did is the, the top bit on the left is the game setup, and then the, the bottom bit on the left actually gets them to think about tactical questions uh, and things to ask themselves when they're playing the game or in a reflection after the game about how aggressive they are and about how much risk and safety they take. So it's a good way of um, you know applying the knowledge that they've been gaining through the uh, practice activities that... Um, Heidi's been talking about, and I would argue that these would be appropriate, um, you know, at different ages with some with some tweaks here and there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. So as we wrap it up, I just have some main points for you. So um, get good games going to draw your students in, and we want to reduce that game complexity so that students have success. So creating that just right challenge for them and. That can be challenging for us to really think on our toes and uh, figure out how to modify those games. Tactics and skills are practiced together. And we use the game to teach and explore concepts. Um, the teacher becomes that game shaper and has to be a really a keen observer um, and be a just-in-time facilitator. So you got to know when to change it or when to ask questions and probe. Um, so as situations arise in a game, uh, students, their appreciation for that skill uh, starts to develop. And um, 
you know, they want they want to be able to uh, confront that tactical problem in a different way. So I'd like to give a shout out to Westfield State University students and Bridgewater State University as well as Maple Shade Elementary students for the videos and all the help. And here are the references that I used today. Um, of course, my dissertation and then it's a great article by Scott Kretschmar called Life on Easy Street. It really talks about um, longer units um, in that article. And then, of course, uh, the complexity aspects and some of the games uh, were from Mitchell, Oslin, and Griffin, 2013, Teaching Sport Concepts and Skills, a Tactical Games Approach for Ages 7 to 18. All right. All right. Hey, Heidi, thanks so much uh, for your great uh, TGFU presentation. And, um, you know, just so glad that you could share your expertise with us. Um, and, Steve, thanks for joining us as well. Uh, so I would, uh, first of all, make sure everyone that's been watching to fill out the conference survey. And second of all, if you want to continue this conversation and you have questions for Heidi or Steve, please go ahead and head to that Tozzle and ask those questions there, and they can give you a hand with that. So, hey, everyone, thanks again so much, and we're glad that you could join us. Thank you, Colin.